The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. How does 1 John 3, 9 fit into free grace theology and into eternal security? It's a great question. Hope you'll stay tuned for the answer with Bob Wilkin and Steve Elkins. This is the radio and podcast ministry of the Grace Evangelical Society. Our name is Grace in Focus. Thank you for joining us today. By the way, the Grace Evangelical Society is starting an online seminary that will be free for all who maintain at least a B average. You can earn an MDiv degree. For more information and to register, go to our website, faithalone.org. You will find there a tab for seminary in our navigation menu. Everything you need is right there, including how to contact us for more about the seminary. That's faithalone.org and find seminary in our navigation menu. I'll repeat this at the end of today's discussion, which starts right now. Here are Steve Elkins and Bob Wilkin. Steve, I've got a question here from John. John says, I've been wondering about 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 through 9 a lot lately, but I still don't know how it can fit into free grace and eternal security. Thanks in advance. What I like about John's question, he's basically talking about meditation. When he says, I've been wondering about oh. 1 John 3, 6 to 9 lately, oh. He's chewing on it. Yeah, okay. He's meditating on it. Yeah. That's a good thing. That is a good and him asking us to talk about yeah. it is a good thing. He may or may not agree with what we have to say, but could you read First John 3, 6 through 9? You know, and I would add to that to pray about it. Yes, amen. You know, I remember Zane saying the two on the road to Emmaus, and he, you know, kind of rebukes them, oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe and all that the prophets have spoken, all right. that Christ to have suffered and then entered to his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he shared with them the things concerning himself. Well, later, he meets with these two on the road to Emmaus. He's talking with, he's hanging out with them a little bit. When they realize who it is, he suddenly vanishes. I don't know if he right. just disappears or what. But then they realize who he is. They say, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened the scriptures to us. Amen. And Zane Hodges said, why would we think he's not still doing that? And we need to make it a practice, I think, when we sit down to read the Bible anytime to say a quick prayer to the Lord, and certainly when we're studying it, to help us understand. Whether we formally say a prayer or not, our attitude every time we read the Word of God is, yeah. Holy Spirit, I need you yeah. to open this text for me. Whether I literally yeah. pray that prayer or not, Amen. that has yeah. to be my attitude. It can't be if I just go through the right practices, if I use the right Bible study tools, if I do it in the right way, I'm going to get the truth. No, this is spiritually revealed. And so my attitude needs to be dependent on God every yeah. time I read the Word of God. You know, piggyback on that, in Isaiah, it says, this is the one on whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite of heart and trembles at my word. Amen. I think that's a wonderful attitude to have. Well, the passage says, First John 3, I'll just read 6 and 9. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. And then verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Bob, the first class I had was Zane Hodges. We had it together, the book of Hebrews. Right after the first class, I made a beeline to Zane at front, and I didn't know him personally so well, so I call him Professor Hodges. Right. I said, uh, there's two passages that are really giving me a tough time. First Corinthians 6, that no immoral person, idolater, swindler, etc., will inherit the kingdom of God. He quickly cleared that up by just saying, Steve, if I'm in your house, that's one thing. If I've inherited it, it's another thing. The inheritance is a full-blown New Testament doctrine. And come to find out that's the whole book of Hebrews that we'll be studying the rest of the semester. So that was good. That settled that. But it took him just a little more time to explain this one. And this was my second passage, 1 John 3, 6 and 9. Yeah. Because at Young Life, I'd gotten confused a little bit. I was clear that we get eternal life, John three sixteen by just believing Jesus for it. J. Vernon McGee said, faith plus nothing equals salvation. And I right. would say that. But the next week, I remember saying, and this was just for a small period, thank goodness, but I said, now, if you're sleeping with your girlfriend on an ongoing basis, now, these are non-believer, non-church-going kids, you're not a true believer. Mm. If you're an alcoholic, you're not a true believer. And immediately, I felt as if God had hit me with a baseball bat because I realized both of these things can't be true at the same time. 
the free grace idea that you just believe him or that you can't be a practicing sinner. And I got that idea from 1 John 3, 6, and 9, because in the NIV and the New American Standard, which so many used back then, it says, no one who abides in him practices sin. No one who is born of God practices sin. And I come to find out that that's called the tense fallacy or right. the tense solution. When I was at DTS, I wrote a paper on 1st through 3rd John, and I wrote on 1st John 3, 9. And what I found out is there are at least seven major interpretations Ooh. of what 1st John 3, 9 means. So I think it's important for John to recognize that lots of people have struggled with this yeah. verse. Yeah. And by the way, verse 6 is quite puzzling too. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Really? Is John saying there's such a person that never sins? Not according to 1 John 1, eight and 1 John 1.10. Mm-hmm. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. So what does this mean? Whoever abides in him does not sin. And then he says, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Hodges, in his commentary on 1 John, I think covers this well. What he says is, sin is never an expression of abiding in Christ. When we sin, that's an expression of the flesh, not of abiding in Christ. And when it says, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him, he points out that these are perfect tenses, and the idea is the abiding result is missing. I've taken my eyes off Christ. I'm not knowing him in that experience. Mm. That experience is not an experience of knowing God because God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. In fact, verse 5, which we didn't quote, says, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. No sin. It's not like he just had a little sin. He had zero, has zero, and always will have zero. So therefore, when we abide in him, it's a sinless experience. Mm -hmm. As long as we're abiding in Christ, we are not sinning. And verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin. Some verses, as you say, translate that does not practice sin. That's a fallacy, like you pointed out. Mm -hmm. The basic sense is absolute or the gnomic interpretation, as it's sometimes called. That is, whoever is born of God does not sin at all. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, and he cannot sin. People have to play games with he cannot sin in order to say that the first part says he doesn't sin a lot, but then later on he says he cannot sin at all. Hodges takes the view that the born of God person never sins as an expression of his new nature, or what Hodges would say is his born of God self. Whenever we sin, it's an expression of the flesh, Paul brings this out in Romans 6, 7, and 8, yeah. that sin is always an expression of our mortal bodies. Let me tell you what Zane shared with me. He said, first off, modern Greek scholarship have shown that a Greek present tense cannot be translated with a practicing continuing nuance to it without a qualifying word to go with it. So here it has to be translated in its absolute sense, as you just mentioned. Right. No one who abides in him sins. No one who is born of God sins. But as you pointed out, that brings up some questions because obviously we do still sin, First John 1, 8. But if he said abide is one of John's fellowship words, like in the Upper Room Discourse. If we keep his commandments, we abide in him, for instance. Right. He said insofar as we abide in him, we don't sin. Insofar as we're sinning, we're not abiding in him. And then he said about the new nature in First John 3, 9, the new nature itself is incapable of sinning. It can't sin. And so when I sin, I should view it as something foreign to my truest self, who I now am in Christ. And so we should say, like Paul says in Romans 7, when I sin, it's no longer I who do it, the new I, but sin which indwells me. Personifying sin, as Paul does in the book of Romans, sin that's an indwelling alien agent in our bodies. That's great. Now, I didn't mention the other six views, but one of the other six views is the accident view. And the accident view basically says... Anytime we sin, it's a more or less accident. It's inconsistent with who we really are. Well, that, by the way, is pretty close to Hodge's view, Mm -hmm. this gnomic view, that this is who we are in our inner self. And that the eternal part of us never sins. So what John should recognize is there's nothing here that contradicts eternal security, 
nothing here that contradicts the free grace issue or the free gift of eternal life. The point here is simply that as we abide in Christ, we are living a righteous life and we need to see ourselves essentially as righteous people. Yeah. Zane used to say, it's wrong to think of us as a worm. What a wretched worm I am and think yeah. I'm really a bad person and that's who I am at the core of my being. No, at the core of my being, I'm sinless. Right. And if I live consistent with who I really am, the imago Dei, the image of God, mm-hmm. then I'm going to live righteously. Yeah. Something you said, too, about when it says no one who sins has seen him or known him. That doesn't come out of our true knowledge of who the Lord is. Right. And Zane would use it as an example, for instance, David. He's a believer. He's saved. But when he sins, and he did some terrible sins, doing those actions didn't come out of his intimate knowledge of God. Right. He was a man after God's own heart, but not in those actions. Exactly. Yeah. And so we make a terrible mistake to think knowing him here in verse 6 means being a believer. In fact, it does not in 1 John 2, 3 or elsewhere in the book, knowing him is knowing him in my experience. Exactly. Now, if you're a believer, you know him, but you need to know him more and more and more. Right. Just like in a marriage or anything else. Right. Well, thanks so much, Steve, and thank you each for listening. And remember, keep grace Grace in focus. The Grace Evangelical Society is starting an online seminary where you can take specific classes or earn an MDiv degree. First Year Greek starts week of August the 6th. Many other classes start the week of August the 20th. Go to our website, faithalone.org. You will find there a tab for seminary in our navigation menu. Everything you need is right there, including professors, application deadlines, class schedules, and how to contact us for more about the seminary. If you're interested, we need to hear from you soon. For information or to register, that's faithalone.org and find seminary in our navigation menu. Our goal at the Grace Evangelical Society is to teach Scripture clearly and without confusion. One of the best tools for that clarity, we believe, is our website. It's faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. On our site, we have all kinds of materials that are designed to help you mature and grow in your faith and your understanding of Scripture. Please come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. You'll be glad you did. God loves a cheerful giver, and that's why we think our financial partners are some of the happiest people in the world. If you would like to learn how to become a financial partner with Grace and Focus, we would very much appreciate it. Learn more at faithalone.org. It's really exciting to hear from our listeners. So if you've got a question, comment, or feedback, I hope you'll reach out to us. Best way to do that is through email. Here is our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. On the next episode, questions and a discussion on two judgments and on resurrection bodies. Please join us next time. This is the Grace Evangelical Society. Until next time, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.